If you're only going to watch one video this year about how to start and grow a YouTube channel, then make it this one because we're pretty much going to cover everything, which is jolly convenient. Now, there is no doubt that YouTube is one of the best ways to express your creativity, but you've got to have the right mindset to grow a channel from zero views to millions. This is true for all creators, no matter their goals on the YouTube platform. It is hard to attract 100, 1,000, 10,000 views per video if you don't embrace the creator mentality. So these are three commonly underrated beliefs that will allow you to succeed on YouTube. You can start and indeed grow a YouTube channel with nothing more than one of these and a connection to the internet. Mr. Beast of all people proved that when he started his channel with nothing more than an iPhone 6. And there are countless YouTube shorts creators that are blowing up on the platform with nothing more than one of these. Second of all, making terrible videos will not destroy your channel if you're willing to learn along the way. It's almost a rite of passage. Everybody looks back at their first videos and goes, jeez. And finally, longevity is better than overnight success. Consistent views trump viral videos. In most cases, when creators go viral, they don't know what to do with that success. And within a month, they're back to where they started. Now these statements often fly under the radar, but they are the foundations of a successful channel and the creators behind them. It can be very tempting to post whatever you want on YouTube, from DIY projects to hair tutorials to your latest cryptocurrency splurge. I don't know why I'm using this as a reference point. It has nothing to do with cryptocurrencies. Anyway, it's your channel. What's wrong with mixing things up from time to time? Viewers will learn to appreciate your love for soccer, wrestling, tech, games, and YouTube education, right? Well, unfortunately, that's generally not how viewers tend to think. They tend to want to see videos that cater to a specific interest time and time again from a specific creator. So to make that happen for your channel, you want to find a niche that you are passionate about and start creating content consistently within that sphere. Simply put, over the long run, you will get more views on YouTube if you make focused content. And here's why. YouTube's recommendation system will be better able to connect your videos with similar videos that similar viewers like to watch on a more frequent basis. And you will build a much bigger, much stronger community from like-minded viewers watching your content and sharing in the experience. Imagine for a second that YouTube is a market. What commodities are being bought and sold? Essentially, you are trading value for views, watch time, subscribers. That means every video that you upload must offer something the viewer wants. This might be an escape from boredom through comedy or entertainment, home buying tips, delicious recipes, wherever your expertise and skills lie. So if you're able to master this marketplace, you will get a lot of views on YouTube through this exchange. One of the first steps to this is a value proposition or a short slogan that describes your channel very succinctly. Let me give you a few examples. Creator obsessed YouTube education, that's pretty easy to remember because it's our own. Decoding the mysteries of a galaxy, that could be for a space exploration channel. Or maxing out your digital money, a cryptocurrency channel. Again, I have no idea why this is here. On the surface, these statements look like channel summaries, but they're actually channel promises. It's also a reminder to you, the creator, of your commitment. And that's to provide a value that viewers both want and expect. This will sound obvious, but if you don't know what viewers are searching for or what's trending on YouTube, it's almost impossible to make videos that people want to watch. And yet so often creators will just press record and then figure out how to pitch their videos to an audience at the end of a process. So a simple solution to this is to do a little bit of planning before you start your video. And that can start with keyword research. Ideally, what you're trying to find here is high search volume keywords, especially if they're trending, with low video competition. And if you need help doing this, vidIQ has a handy keyword research tool. Simply type a word or phrase into the search bar and vidIQ will give you tons of information about how the keyword is performing currently on YouTube. Keyword research can help you in many different ways. First of all, it's a pretty cool ideas generator. Secondly, it will help you understand the language, educate you on the vocabulary of a topic. Think cryptocurrency and all of the related keywords. And once you have a deep understanding of all of this language, you can apply it to your titles, thumbnails, descriptions, even the words you say on camera. So use keyword research to plan your videos, not just to add these words in as video tags once you've made the video. You're really selling yourself short because tags really haven't been effective on YouTube for a couple of years now. 
So we haven't got around to recording our video yet, and that's okay because we've still got more planning to do. While keyword research will help you spark an idea, the thing that really helps guide you in a video and keep you focused is knowing what the title is again before you press record. Basically, a title does two things in as few characters as possible. It tells you what the video is about and then why you should care. And if titles achieve this, they are compelling, intriguing, hard not to click on. Here's an example from one of our vidIQ videos. The idea is how to get 1000 subscribers, but that title has been used many times on YouTube already. So in this video, we played about with the idea a little bit and came up with a title of still under a thousand subscribers. This might be why. The first part of the title identifies who this video is for. And the second part establishes a fear of missing out mentality. If I don't watch this video, I will still not know nor understand why I'm under 1000 subscribers. Think of it like this. You need to turn your idea into a newspaper headline. And to write better titles, try to capture your community's shared language. For example, let's take a look at Zussi the Pity. This adorable talking dog has a YouTube channel with 40 million views. And one reason people love Zussi is because of his droopy eyes and the classic head tilts. Another reason is the amazing titles on the YouTube videos. His owner uses keywords such as talking pitbull because pitbulls are vocal and expressive with humans. And it's say relatable detail. Plus, Zeus's owner calls himself Dad, embracing the parent-child relationship between dogs and their owners. With all of that being said, check out this title and see how it all comes together. Talking Pitbull argues with his dad, this dog is too smart. Can you see the appeal there? The title speaks the language of dog enthusiasts and has some emotional intrigue. <coughs> this dog is too smart? And guess what? The video has more than 200,000 views. The most important thing you should do on day one of starting a new YouTube channel is to verify that YouTube channel. That will give you access to YouTube's second most important feature after uploading YouTube videos, uploading custom thumbnails. And here's a curious YouTube oddity. The first thing a viewer sees, the thumbnail, is typically the last thing a creator makes in their video process. So along with planning and research and titles, Try to make your thumbnails before you press record. And here's nine thumbnail rules you should follow. Yeah, I think I've counted that right. Keep your thumbnails simple. Viewers should be able to interpret them in less than two seconds. Communicate just one idea, theme or concept from the video. For example, if it's a video sharing 10 tips, focus on the one that's gonna have the biggest draw for the viewer. Use no more than three dominant colors, any more than that, and the thumbnail just tends to look cluttered. Don't be afraid to artificially increase the vibrancy and the pop of the thumbnails because when they're shrunk down to size, that can really wash out the colors. Often you'll want to remove backgrounds because they are so chaotic. For example, I never try and use this background in the thumbnails because there's just too much going on. If you're going to be taking still images of yourself for the thumbnails in some sort of YouTube pose, I highly recommend a ring light. Try to evenly space out objects and elements throughout the thumbnail. Don't leave any negative bland space. You are insistent on using text, limit it as much as possible. I would say no more than four words and make it big and very readable. In terms of key thumbnail elements, I would try and limit this to four. That might be a person, an object the person is looking at, a background color, and maybe some text. But I will stress of all of those points, the key is to keep it simple. Now again, vidIQ has a really handy tool to help you with this. It's called Thumbnail Previews. What this will do is match up your thumbnail and title against the best ranking videos for a particular keyword search. And it does all of this before you even press publish. So if you're looking at your thumbnails and thinking, nah, they're just not as good as the other ones, viewers are probably gonna think the same thing, but at least you have a chance to fix it because you've not even published your video yet. All right then, so you've got your title, you've got your thumbnail, you're ready to record, which is fantastic. But here's another thing really important that you need to consider. You will lose a large portion of your audience in the first 30 seconds of your YouTube video. Now, some of this is down to the way YouTube works. They make it very easy for somebody to flick onto the next video. But most of it is down to you and your skill or lack of skill in pulling the viewer into your video. Now, obviously, if your viewers stay for longer, that means you earn more watch time. And if you're on a journey to 4,000 hours of watch time for monetization, nah. but the better reward is the impact your videos have on your viewers. And if it's a very positive and satisfying one, that viewer is gonna return to more of your content in the future. So what we're talking about here is the video hook, not a branded intro. 
my personal recommendation is to get rid of them completely. Here's what you need to do to hook a viewer. Make it quick, make it snappy. Start delivering on what you promised in the title and the thumbnail the moment somebody clicks on it. As well as completely getting rid of branded intros, hold back the generic intro as well, where you introduce yourself, what the channel is about, and why people should subscribe. You haven't done anything to deserve that yet. If you do want to introduce yourself, fine. Do it after a minute, 90 seconds, once the viewer's got settled into what they were promised. Think about how you can tease juicier parts of the video. Maybe take two or three seconds of climactic action from later on in the video and then leave it on a cliffhanger. Or do something funny, unique or unexpected that catches the viewer a little off guard. <laughs> video hooks certainly require experimentation because they are so hard to get right. But because it's the first few seconds that every viewer is going to see before they abandon the video, it is also crucially important. Next up, it's time to write a compelling video description for your content. Now in one sense, it needs to be short and sweet because you don't have that much space to play with beneath the video. While you do have the luxury of 5,000 characters in your video description box, in order to see all of that description, viewers need to do quite a bit of work. And so there is a concept called above the fold. In YouTube's case, when you do a search on the search page, you'll see two lines of the description. When you're watching a video on mobile, again, you'll see a little bit of description before you need to tap more. That's all below the fold. So the first 150 characters of a description, roughly the size of a tweet, are crucial. In those first 150 characters of a video description, you should be telling viewers what the video is about and why they should watch it. You can put all of the extra information, such as a detailed description of the video, information about your channel, links to resources, affiliate links, reasons to subscribe, that can all wait until further down in the description, along with timestamps. Try to keep these two things in mind. Make the video description an accurate representation of a video to satisfy viewers. And secondly, yes, many large channels neglect their video descriptions, but that doesn't mean you should. There are probably some, albeit small, SEO gains from descriptions, and anything you can do to gain a marginal edge over channels of a similar size to you is worth doing. Now, as a massive bonus in this video, we are including tons of links to dozens of articles that go into a lot more detail about all of the aspects we're talking about in this huge video. Definitely worth checking out. Video chapters or timestamps, are they a good thing or a bad thing for your YouTube videos? Some people think that this allows viewers to skip around a video, find what they need and then immediately bounce. And to some extent, that is definitely true, especially for search-based content. But let me ask you this very simple question. As a creator, do you want your viewers to leave your videos feeling frustrated or satisfied? For example, a viewer could watch the first two and a half minutes of your video saying, yeah, yeah, come on, get onto it. Come on, come on, all right, I'm bored. I'm leaving this video. Or they jump to a specific part in the video, watch it for one minute and think, yeah, that's exactly what I needed. Thank you very much. In some cases, the viewer will stick around to watch more even after they've got what they needed. And it builds trust and loyalty with your viewers. They know that if they got satisfied in the past by your content and they need something else on YouTube, they may come to you for answers. In addition to the viewer benefits, you get to name your chapters, which is almost like adding a second title to your videos. And in terms of screen real estate, that these chapters take up, especially on Google search, is quite striking. Also in the middle of 2021, YouTube introduced automatic chapters, which will try and figure out what your video is about for you and then add chapters unless you manually turn it off. So would you rather you do that or YouTube automatically try and figure things out? Without a shadow of a doubt, the best promotional tool you have at your disposal is organic reach through YouTube's recommendation system or impressions. What's going to help you most of that are fantastic thumbnails, great titles and videos that people want to watch. And if viewers are enjoying watching your videos, the next best promotional tool, again, without a shadow of a doubt, are end screens. These appear in the last 5 to 20 seconds of a video and they give you the creator an opportunity to push your viewer to the next best video that they should be watching from your channel. And that's going to develop session watch time, binge viewing content on YouTube. Let me show you one example of the power of end screens. This video, 50 days into its life, is getting 60% of its traffic through end screens. We are directing viewers from one video to go watch this video 
through end screens and that is pretty incredible. So when it comes to end screens, I've got two strategies I suggest you test. First of all, try just one end screen, just one call to action. So don't include a subscribe button, associated links, a second video option, just one video you want to direct the viewer to. That makes the call to action very intentional and it gives the viewer one choice which they're much more likely to click on. And second of all, keep it short and simple. Yes, you can have a 20 second end screen, but that's probably too long. As for info cards that appear in the middle of videos, I've got somewhat of a mixed opinion on that. Absolutely, it's another way to promote other content on your channel, but you're doing it in the middle of a video that somebody's watching. So I always encourage people to test these types of tools, but what I would recommend is putting these info cards maybe more than halfway into the video so that what a viewer hopefully does is say, right, I'm gonna bookmark that suggestion, I'm gonna watch the end of this video and then maybe come back to the info card if the end screen doesn't entice me enough. YouTube, when it feels like it, will randomly caption your videos. But does it do a good job? Let us know in the comments below. Most of the time it will do a decent job, but it won't be punctuated very well. And it will often be filled with somewhat embarrassing errors. That can be a problem for more people than what you might imagine. For example, in America, almost 40 million people over the age of 12 report some loss of hearing. So if you want to attract more viewers to your content, make it more inclusive, more accessible, make transcripts for your videos. Now there are tools that will do the transcribing for you. We use Rev, we've used it for years and they do a very good job. All I need to do is sign into my Rev account, pick a video that's already been uploaded to YouTube and it will transcribe it usually within about 12 hours, which is a pretty remarkable service. Hashtag not sponsored. And just to show you how important this is, 25% of our English listening audience use captions. For the vidIQ channel, that's half a million views per month that are benefiting from captions, which is remarkable. And to add to that, according to Verizon, almost 70% of people watch videos with the sound off in public. Now, of course, there is a cost associated with transcribing your videos, and it may not seem like it's worth it when you're only getting 100 views per video. But once you are monetized on YouTube and you are earning income from ad revenue, this is one of the easiest and relatively cheapest ways to reinvest back into your channel. And if you want to take this to the next level, you can get professional voice actors to translate your videos into different languages. Entonces, ¿su canal está en un espiral descendiente? That's what I sound like in Spanish. This is what I sound like in Russian. The team who do this are called Unilingo, and they also translate Mr. Beast videos into foreign languages, so we're in good company. Yes, there is quite a significant cost attached to this, but the rewards are pretty incredible. Another uber powerful way of promoting your content is through sharing. But I don't mean you sharing your content, I mean viewers sharing your content. When a video pulls a strong emotion from a viewer, that viewer wants their friends and family to feel the same way, and so inevitably they share it with them. The viewer may also want to share it with their communities on the internet, this is effectively the word of mouth effect. And so naturally, you wanna make sure that your videos are embeddable. Now this is usually on by default, but just to make sure it is, you can go to the content screen in the YouTube studio, edit one of your videos, and then scroll down this page until you see the checkbox that allows embedding. While embedding videos may be one of YouTube's oldest features at this point, there are tons of new tools and analytics seemingly coming out on a daily basis right now. To give you a few random examples over the past 12 months, YouTube have introduced Shorts, they've completely overhauled the YouTube Studio app, and they've taken away public dislikes. So swings and roundabouts a little bit. But here's some more stuff they've introduced recently, and if used properly, all of this can help you become a better creator. It's as if YouTube is constantly whispering, here's a small gift to help you gain more views. And you should test these new features to see how and if they grow your channel. And don't forget that vidIQ is releasing new tools on a regular basis as well, such as daily ideas that will suggest up to 50 ideas every single day based on your video topic on YouTube. Pretty cool, right? At the same time, be cautious and experiment within reason. None of these are magic keys to unlock the secrets of YouTube success, but at the same time, they shouldn't be used as excuses as to why your channel isn't growing. Usually, typically, it comes down to you and your content. 
Now, as I said earlier on in this video, the best way to grow consistently on YouTube isn't by going viral. The better and more patient strategy is to measure the performance of your videos, see what worked and didn't work, and adjust accordingly for your audience. Now, ever since YouTube transitioned from the classic YouTube studio, if anyone can remember this, to the new YouTube studio, simply put, the analytics are at a different level. Most of you will start your YouTube journey with the simple notion of getting more views and getting subscribers, but it's a lot more nuanced than that. So these are some of the analytics that are worth measuring, benchmarking, and using to gauge channel health and performance on a regular basis. And those are click-through rate, new versus return viewers, audience retention rate versus typical, relative audience retention rate, audience retention after the first 30 seconds, average views per viewer. These are the metrics to pay attention to when you want more views. Now, if one of your videos does go viral, investigate the data around it. What caused it to spike? And that may help you reproduce that viral moment. And don't forget vidIQ's own channel audit tool. It's kind of like a school report card. It will tell you what's working on your channel, what isn't working on your channel, and things that you may need to fix from a logistical standpoint, such as including end screens in your videos. If you are a regular viewer of vidIQ videos, you should know by now my stance on quantity versus quality. And simply put, I believe that Today's quantity leads to tomorrow's quality. And that, I admit, opinion is amplified if you are a smaller channel or somebody who's just starting out on YouTube because you have so much to learn. But let's explore that in a little bit more detail. When you are new to YouTube, no one, and unfortunately I mean no one, knows who you are, including YouTube's recommendation system, otherwise known as the algorithm. The more videos you make, the more YouTube will understand about your videos and how they relate to other videos that viewers are watching. So I would suggest for the average channel in your first six months, aiming to make between 25 and 50 videos. And the first thing I will guarantee when you meet this quantity milestone is that you'll look back on your first video and say, Geesh! from a YouTube recommendation discovery algorithm perspective, it will start to understand whether you are a creator of cat videos, gardening, cryptocurrency investing, still not relevant, whatever the topic is you want to make videos about. When professional athletes go out onto the field or into the arena, it is after thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of practice. Well, in one sense, YouTube is the same. It requires thousands of hours of practice, patience, and learning. But the difference is it's better to do all of this in public because you get so much feedback from it. And there are pretty much no penalties, especially when you're starting out your new channel because you've got nothing to lose. Making these videos will help develop consistency, getting better at video production, optimizing your video content, such as the titles and thumbnails, learning what it takes to make quality videos. Also, as a final point on this topic, by making all of these videos, you will discover whether or not you actually enjoy making videos. If you want to become a YouTube creator, you're going to be doing a lot of that over many number of years. Let's get one thing clear. You're not the only creator on YouTube that has a passion for a topic. The chances are there are millions of people who are just as passionate about you as a topic and thousands of those who want to share their passion on YouTube. So not only do you need to come up with ideas for your topic, you also need to figure out the best way to communicate those ideas to viewers. And that comes through different video formats. And here are several formats that tend to work really well on YouTube. The classic versus video, comparing one thing to another to create discussion, controversy, help a viewer with a purchasing decision. The classic listicle, be it the best, the worst, the tallest, the smallest, the fastest, the slowest, the cheapest, the most expensive. You can take these listicle ideas and insert them into pretty much any video topic. Again, it's likely to create conversation and controversy if it's a subjective opinion. And with listicle videos, you're pretty much refreshing the topic of the video every two or three minutes when you list the next thing, which can help with audience retention. The how-to video, pretty simple this one. YouTube is often quoted as being the second largest search engine in the world. so. Literally millions of people are coming onto the platform to get answers 
through the audio video format. This is a really good example of the YouTube marketplace I talked about earlier. A creator offering their value and their knowledge in exchange for viewer time and satisfaction. And when you have knowledge that is unique to you, that is in high demand, that is the perfect opportunity to share that knowledge on YouTube. The reaction video, adding your thoughts, opinions, conversation to something that's happening in the world, especially if it's trending. A good recent example of this is Microsoft's intention to buy Activision. Pretty much every single gaming channel should be reacting to this in some way, but adding their own unique voice to the conversation. These are some of the most common and easy to learn video formats, but they're also some of the most successful. As you gain confidence as a creator, you'll be able to blend these formats together or come up with entirely new formats, again, that are unique to you and they can't be replicated easily. Some of you may argue against the concept of channel focus and niching down, but I'm sure we can all agree on this point. Your videos should have some form of relationship to one another, a through line that connects them all. Ideally, here's what you want to happen. You want a viewer to watch one of your videos and be satisfied by it enough to do a bit more research on your channel, see what other videos you've made. And if there is a connection between what they've already seen, there's more chance that they will watch it. At the same time, you want the viewer to anticipate what you're going to make next and want to watch it. So this is the YouTube recommendation system, the algorithm connecting your videos together, which is perfect. But of course, what you can do is manually create these connections through playlists. Here's a question that I will always pose to a creator. If you have a video, that cannot go in an existing playlist or doesn't form the start of a new playlist and a collection of videos, what's it doing on your channel? And of course, once you have a viewer in a playlist, there's a much higher potential for binge watching your content since YouTube is gonna play the next video in that playlist. Now, if you haven't already done this, I recommend creating this playlist right now, or at least after this video. Title the playlist something along the lines of new to this channel, here's what we do and fill it with the videos that best represent what you do on your channel. The ones that match your value proposition the most. You want visitors to your channel and content to know instinctively whether or not they're in the right place as quickly as possible. And that playlist is gonna help them do that. I've already said that the best way to promote your videos is to master YouTube's recommendation system. But on top of that, there is a built-in YouTube tool that is not only gonna build your community, but will have the side benefit of promoting your content when you're not publishing videos. And that of course is YouTube's community tab, which you get access to once you reach 500 subscribers. The benefit of this is that it is a touch point for your YouTube audience when you're not publishing videos. We all know that videos take a long time to create, but a community post could be done in as little as five minutes, especially on a day when you haven't released a video. Now, let me stress that the community tab shouldn't be used just to promote your videos. They should be a form of engagement and value in themselves. A very simple example of this could be asking your community what type of video you should make next through a voting poll or asking the community a question, which they can try to answer within the community post, but also you provide an answer or a discussion point to that question through a video link. As I say, if the user engages with the community post itself, they're more likely to watch a video that is attached to it. Now, as with anything, it will take up time to build up your reach and engagement through the community tab. It almost seems to have its own discovery algorithm. And I recommend posting no more than one or two posts a day. But for typically what you put into a community post, which is five or 10 minutes worth of work, you get a tremendous output and you're reaching your audience via another form of communication. Whatever topic you're passionate about, there are likely trends within it and you should be following them because it's very likely those viewers who are passionate about the same topic want to be informed of those trends. Here are a few examples of the type of trends that we saw during the pandemic lockdown. Pretty much every gamer started playing Among Us. People started to explore their hobbies a lot more at home, such as baking bread. There was a monumental surge in fitness instructors. And we had people who were laid off from their jobs due to the pandemic turning into entrepreneurs and starting their own businesses and charting that journey on YouTube. So what we're talking about here aren't necessarily viral trends such as Squid Game. These are trends within your niche. Every video 
you post needs to matter to your target audience, irrespective of its chances of going viral. And you don't want to fall into the trap of only posting trending topic videos. There are likely topics in your niche that have a more evergreen element to them. And these videos are likely to perform much better over a very long period of time, as opposed to trends, which might give your channel a short boost in the arm for a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months. I find that when I'm following trending news topics and stories in the YouTube education space, if I can instinctively think up of an idea, the chances are my audience is going to be interested in that. And if you do want to keep up with the latest trends in your video topic, you can create custom trend alerts for your channel through vidIQ. We'll keep tabs on specific keywords or channels and track their performance. It will even send you an email alert when it finds a video of particular interest in a topic that you may want to add your own voice and conversation to. A lot of content is uploaded to YouTube because the barriers to entry are so low. As long as you have a mobile phone and an internet connection, you can start uploading videos instantly for free. So something you're gonna need to figure out is what makes you different from all of those other creators. Now in the past, we've called this your superpower, be it juggling, animating, dog whispering. Yeah, that really is a thing. Whatever skills you excel at and talents that are unique to you, make sure to use them in your videos. Why should you do this, I hear you ask? Put simply, it makes you and your content much harder to replicate. Let me give you a quick example of this. MKBHD, Marquez Brownlee, has been one of the leading creators in the tech space for over a decade. But how does he continue to innovate, stay ahead of the rest of the competition? Many of the things he pioneered in the tech YouTube space have been replicated by the next generation of creators. So this is what he's done. He's taken it to the next very financially expensive level. He revealed in a recent interview that he has spent a quarter of a million dollars on a robot arm that can move cameras in a fast, unique way that is pretty much impossible to replicate unless you have that type of money. He prides himself on quality videos that you can't get anywhere else. And unless anybody's got the cash, he's gonna stay ahead of the game. But also remember this, while he has the funds and resources to do this now, he started out just like you making videos with what he had, where he had in his bedroom. And I bet you a considerable amount of V's that Marquez looks back on his first videos and says to himself, Jeesh! But with every step he's taken, he's added more unique properties and value to his content. It's the same with Mr. Beast, as I mentioned earlier. He started off with an iPhone, but look what he's capable of doing now. This is all through reinvesting back into his channel. There are five questions you can ask yourself to discover whether or not you are truly unique. Is my content any different or better than a comparative channel's content? Have I established traditions and rituals with my audience? This, for example, could be giving your community a nickname and using catchphrases that are unique to your tribe. Am I the first person to post particular types of videos within my topic where others follow? Is my content related yet refreshing. And, put very simply, why should someone watch my videos? Now a creator who's done this more recently than Marquez Brownlee is Jake Fellman, and he's a content creator that took his very unique 3D animation skills and applied them to the popular video game Among Us, but to stay with trends he's transitioned from there to Minecraft to Friday nights at Freddy's. Essentially what Jake Feldman is doing is taking his exceptional animation skills that are very, very difficult to replicate and blending them with trending topics on YouTube. And you know what? I think that deserves its own buzzword, creative entrepreneurship. And now within a space of about 16 months, he has 10 million subscribers and billions of YouTube shorts views. <laughs> Collaborations allow all creators involved to share their YouTube audiences, which can only be a good thing, right? They also allow the creators to make truly unique content. Remember, going back to what we said previously, unique content that is impossible to find anywhere else is going to be a hook for an audience. Here at vidIQ, we've collaborated recently with Emily D. Baker, Ben Johnson, and of course, Nate from Channel Makers. We've enjoyed a great experience from those collaborations, and I'll tell you what, I've learned a thing or two. I don't know if you've noticed this, but the production quality of my 
Live videos has significantly increased in the last few months thanks to Ben Johnson's influence on lighting and setting manual controls on my camera. I didn't do that for years. Here are three things to consider with collaborations. Obviously you want a crossover of audience, even if you are at opposite ends of the Venn diagram. Spend time building your relationship off camera. It may even develop into a friendship and that's gonna produce a much better video with great chemistry. And for the typical collaboration, I would give yourself at least double the time you would usually spend on making a video because yeah, they can be quite challenging logistically. Now, where do you find collaborators? Through communities. Join groups that represent your niche. That could be subreddits, Discord chats, Facebook groups. The goal is to find creators you like and admire and build genuine relationships. And here at vidIQ, we have all of them. Now as an extra bonus on this topic, how do you get the attention of creators who are much larger than you? Well, here's my very quick personal story. You offer something to that creator's community for free that also has value for your own community. Back in 2016, I made a video on my own tech channel about how to add tags to videos and I used vidIQ as a tool to educate people. I sent out a tweet and within 24 hours, the boss at vidIQ had contacted me and the rest is history. And that single tweet has spawned a six year collaboration between myself and vidIQ that continues today. YouTube viewers are a fickle bunch, aren't they? Just ask anyone who subscribed to your channel more than three months ago. But don't blame them for being a tad distracted. There's so much to see on YouTube. A YouTube user could visit up to 20 channels in a single day and not subscribe to one of them. And so that's why, instead of creators focusing on getting users to click the subscribe button, they should be focused on building relationships with their viewers. One of the ways to do this is to directly engage with your viewers in your videos. And that can be simply done by asking a question. But the important thing is asking that question early on in the video. For example, at the very beginning of this video, I asked people why they wanted to get 1,000 subscribers. And now that video has more than 50,000 comments. As I predicted, most people said that they wanted to get a thousand subscribers to monetize their channel. And I spent pretty much the rest of the video trying to rationalize against that mindset as you start your YouTube journey. Now, of course, along with you asking questions in the videos, you're gonna get a lot of comments and you should try as much as possible to reply to every single comment, especially when you're only getting five to 10 comments per video. Those are your most loyalist fans you need to treat them like kings and queens. Now, as your channel grows, you'll get more comments and it gets more and more difficult to reply to them all, but vidIQ has a handy free tool. Set up a couple of template responses, especially to questions that you are often asked, and you can click a couple of buttons and pop in more responses more quickly. I'm telling you, that has saved me literally thousands of hours over the years. And if you really want to interact with your audience, there is nothing better than doing a live stream. Sometimes it's better if you just do minimal planning because you get spontaneous stuff like this. I'm lost. <laughs> lost in space. Help. Am I dead? I can't understand what, what happened to me. My dead hamster. Oh, he's here too. I love you, dead hamster. I'm telling you, we're a professional outfit here at vidIQ. Let me stress one more point here. The goal isn't necessarily to get people to subscribe to your content. What you want is new viewers to enjoy your content, engage with you, the creator, and then potentially watch your previous videos and then watch your next videos. Return viewers, that's where it's at. So I've intentionally left this topic until late on in this video because quite frankly, a lot of people don't wanna hear this, but it's fact. YouTube shorts are here to stay. Now a lot of people hate the concept of short form content, but a lot more people watch short form content. I'm looking at a YouTube report that's just been published that states that YouTube shorts have now hit five trillion views. And that's in around about 18 months, which is astonishing. So. Regardless of whether you decide to make YouTube shorts, you at least need to be aware of the impact shorts are gonna have 
on the YouTube platform. There is already the Shorts Creator Fund, which can allow creators to earn up to $10,000 per month. It's more likely to be a couple of hundred dollars if you get a million views or more on YouTube Shorts. But I believe this is just the beginning. When YouTube figure out how to monetize the short form video industry, which they will, probably within a space of two to three years, it's a game changer. Now here are some general pieces of advice if you want to try and create YouTube Shorts. Although you have 60 seconds to play with, usually a short can be much shorter than it actually is. So if you make a short that is 45 seconds long, I challenge you to trim it down to 20 seconds. The goal of a short seems to be its replayability. In other words, getting audience retention above 100%. YouTube shorts automatically loop. So when a viewer enjoys watching something, they're probably happy to watch it again. And then if they're sat with their friends and family, they may even share that video with one of them. Most of the successful creators have audience retention of 120, 150, 180%. And when it comes to YouTube shorts, a lot of people ask, should I make shorts? shorts on my main channel. My answer to that is if you're asking that question, you're probably not sure about shorts yet or you're not confident of making short form content. So it's best to experiment on a second channel, at least to begin with. If you want to see some examples of creators being successful in the YouTube short space, do check out Jake Fellman, Legal Eagle, Dental Digest, Luke Davidson and Colin Ansemir. Now, in terms of internet age, YouTube at this point is a grandparent being around for over 15 years. And it has one of the largest user bases on the internet with 2 billion monthly users. And so understandably with that, to protect both users, advertisers and creators, there are a lot of rules, guidelines and policies. And if you repeatedly violate these rules and I'm afraid your channel is going to get terminated and your dream of becoming a full-time YouTube creator is over. So obviously, keep your channel in good standing. Remember that you're not just talking to a camera lens or uploading to a computer. You are communicating with and influencing and hopefully positively impacting human being. So start by familiarizing yourself with the YouTube community guidelines. And remember, when you do hit 1000 subscribers and 4000 hours of watch time, yes, you will be able to hopefully monetize your channel. But remember that with that privilege comes responsibilities. Now I'm not here to tell you what all of those policies are, but I will highlight two as main examples. Don't ask for sub for sub. It's a spammy practice and it actually violates YouTube's terms of service. And don't steal other people's content and try to profit from it from one creator to another. From a personal point of view, that's a real scummy thing to do. And I appreciate there's a broader question of copyright here, but that's a video for another day. So I've left this one to the end because everything we've talked about over the last 40 plus minutes falls under this umbrella of being consistent. Whether this is keeping to a schedule and uploading on a regular basis or making related content to similar topics for a specific target audience or making thumbnails that viewers know instinctively come from your channel even though you don't include any branding in them. This is all consistency. I've been wondering recently about the one piece of advice I would give to a creator to reach 1 million subscribers. And I think I've settled on this as my answer be relentless. I am now more than a decade and more than 2000 videos into my YouTube journey, but I still have that same fire, that same passion as I did on day one. I absolutely love making videos. It creatively nourishes me, but I also know what YouTube and the community at large has been able to give back to me. And so that is why I do this from a spiritual point of view. I want to entertain, educate and inspire people to become YouTube creators and influence their communities in a positive and meaningful way. And that's what I've tried to do consistently from the very first day I press record. My goal is to get you as a creator to the same place I am and far beyond a lot faster than I was able to achieve it. But to also remember that the ongoing journey is often far more important than the destination. And quite frankly, you are truly awesome for watching the entirety of this video. It is clear you are passionate about wanting to grow a YouTube channel. And if you want to start that journey, avoiding many of the common mistakes that small creators do make, then make sure to check out the video over here. Yep, that's how you do an end screen, short and snappy. Jeesh.